Welcome to the Physique Development Muscle Series. In this special series, we're breaking down the science and art of training each muscle group. Each episode is dedicated to a specific muscle, providing you with expert insight into its function, dispelling common training misconceptions, and highlighting our go-to exercises that deliver results. We'll also share key execution cues to help you perfect your technique and maximize your gains. Get ready to elevate your training game and achieve your fitness goals like never before. Let's dive into core. A big warm welcome is needed for James Fryer. James is the founder of JDF Integrated Health and is a certified neuromuscular therapist. He has spent over 10,000 hours working with clients in person and has a humongous, and I mean humongous, passion for helping others and for learning, especially all things anatomy and biomechanics. I'm telling you guys right this second, this is one of the smartest dudes I know. James' background started in strength and conditioning, and his interest slowly moved to breathing dysfunctions and developmental movement, and has since obtained multiple, (laughs) and again, I mean multiple, certifications for mobility and others. Since James has helped both myself and Sue with our breathing and our core, and has been an incredible resource for the PD coaches, helping them with their clients and anything that they're running into. This dude is a gym, I'm telling you. It was a no-brainer to bring him on and talk all things core. James, it is fantastic to have you on the podcast today. Thank you. Yes, um, I. there was so many questions that I wanted to have this conversation like over and having conversation on in general, uh, but I think that it's gonna be important for us to just start with the basics. Yeah. So how would you explain, or, or let's say it this way, what is the pelvic floor? What is the pelvic floor? So... I think it might be tough to start with the pelvic floor if we don't start above it, though. Sure. Um, I mean, it's it's important, but the reason that it comes second is because our pelvic floor, like the base, like if you just imagine your pelvis, your pelvis bones, the things you sit on, the sit bones, that is everything down there that you're essentially sitting on is your pelvic floor. So there's a lot of muscles included into that. So we can talk about specific muscles some too. But our pelvic floor is driven by our diaphragm above it. So when we take an inhale, our diaphragm is dropping down due to the lungs filling and creating that negative pressure. And as that drops down, it puts the guts down into the pelvic bowl and the pelvic floor. So we have an inlet and an outlet. So the outlet's the stuff we're sitting on on the bottom. And when we take that breath in, that stuff on the bottom has to catch our guts from falling out the bottom or else they end up on the floor, right? (laughs) So um, everybody's seen, everybody that lifts weights or has watched powerlifting, it's probably seen somebody pee while they're doing a deadlift or a squat, right? Sure. That was where our pelvic floor failed. Mm. It couldn't handle the down pressure and we had some leak come out. So that is not ideal, you know, but when you add an immense amount of pressure down into that muscle, it has to have an immense strength to hold things up. You know, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Mm-hmm. Um, so... If we cannot get our diaphragm to move up and down properly, the diaphragm cannot move up and down properly, okay? So pelvic floor diaphragm are gonna work together. So each inhale down, pelvic floor down. On an exhale, the pelvic floor comes up, diaphragm comes up. Right. So it's like a piston. So we're getting this up and down action happening every time. So if step one, if our inhale or exhale isn't doing what it's supposed to, Pelvic floor never responds properly. So we can't have a proper functioning pelvic floor without a proper functioning diaphragm. Right. So it's technically our pelvic diaphragm and our thoracic diaphragm. Okay. Um, Those two things work really well together if they are stacked on top of each other properly. Um, If one is pushed in front of the other or angled or twisted, we get a little bit of a dysynchronization of diaphragm and pelvic floor working together. Um, That's typically where people get pain on one side or the other, or you can have a right pelvic floor problem 
and not a left. Interesting. You can have an anterior pelvic floor problem and not a posterior pelvic floor problem. So you can think of it as four quadrants in the bottom and four quadrants up in your upper diaphragm as well. Okay. Um, so when we break it down that way, if somebody's twisted, okay, it's going to cause a left and right problem. If somebody's dumped too far forward or what would be considered backward um, for simplicity, um, they would have an anterior or a posterior pelvic floor problem. Okay. But back to the question of what is the pelvic floor? It is a responsive system, okay, based on our breath. So each inhale, we're going to externally rotate the pelvis and the pelvic floor. Mm -hmm. On an exhale, it's going to internally rotate. So if we're talking about lifting weights and moving our bodies, when we want to absorb force and like sink down into a squat, we're externally rotating those joints. So we're inhaling typically when we lower ourselves into the squat or before, depending off the load's really heavy, right? We're getting that inhalation first, mm -hmm. which is creating the external rotation. If we want to push through the floor, okay, we're no longer absorbing force, we're generating that force. So we're pushing the floor to go up and that pressure, that internal rotation, and you'll see with heavy, heavy squats, you'll see knees dive in. That's the body looking for more internal rotation to help push the guts up. Mm. So if you imagine lifting weights as your guts going closer to the floor and your guts getting farther away from the floor, that's essentially what our body is trying to redo. It's resisting things continuing down when we're trying to push up. Mm -hmm like we talked about the P, like if it keeps going down, yeah, <laughs> your body wasn't able to get it all back up. Right. It lost part of that battle. Okay. Okay. So without getting into like too many different problems, like that's where like prolapse symptoms would come in. Like it stuff's going down to the ground and we can't stop it. Right. So our pelvic floor is not helping us enough anymore. So our pelvic floor is just mostly this responsive system that's helping us lower the guts down, and then push the guts back up, which is the same as lowering ourselves down and pushing ourselves back up. Mm -hmm. The better you're good at, the better you are at pushing yourself up, the better you are at lifting more weight up off the floor or jumping higher. Mm -hmm. like you have a really good ability to push up. Yeah. So now you can get your body up really well. Okay. So those things help you lift weights better. If you want to be able to do that, like if that's a goal, and then that works out. If you need to be able to get up off the couch, if you don't have enough pressure to get your guts off the couch, then that's hard too. Right. It's just all relative to that. And then if that system's working well together, you have a happy pelvis, you have strong hips, um, glutes, all those muscles that kind of make up that space. Okay. Um, is there more with that that oh, would certainly. be helpful to dive into specifically obviously like you know what is the pelvic floor it's all the muscles that surround your pelvis right, you know and we could just sit here and yeah. list muscles or we can just like type that in somewhere and people can like look at it but yeah i wanted to give everybody kind of a just a foundational yeah. understanding which i think you did an, mm -hmm. an amazing job of mm -hmm. giving more context to exactly everything that it, it encapsulates mm -hmm. just not just the pelvic floor mm -hmm. but what would you say is the importance during pregnancy because this mm -hmm. is the mm -hmm. main thing yeah. that um if a expecting mother is hearing things about what they need to be doing during the pregnancy it's taking care of their pelvic floor so what is the importance pelvic floor therapy cannot be undervalued like it has been i mean it's just people just don't appreciate it like i think it's the united states i mean we underappreciate a lot of things i think <laughs> um but um other countries people get pelvic floor therapy as like part of their regular gig when they have a kid mm, it's not it's not really a thing here um unless you have a really really poor experience then they'll probably tell you to go to pelvic floor therapy um so when we're talking about pelvic floor therapy and rehab and pregnancy. Um, you can look at pregnancy, honestly, though, the same as somebody that has a huge beer gut. Okay. They're, the, they're one and the same. Um, the baby is essentially incompressible. Like it can't be moved from that spot. Fat is also incompressible. True. So you can't really move. It's in a little bit different place, but it's going to affect your core and your pelvis the same way because you've moved into more of an anterior orientation of your body. So when you're pregnant um, or if you're just very overweight at this point, it's all one and the same in the sense that 
what is happening is we're losing that diaphragm and pelvic floor connection because there's something blocking it at this point, uh, baby. Um, so where pelvis is being tipped forward, belly is getting pushed forward, low back's getting pushed forward. A lot of our extensors are kicking in in our low back. Um, if we want to have a healthy pelvic floor and core, okay, we need to be able to create even expansion with our breath in every direction. So it needs to be going into our belly, our sides and our obliques, and then into our low back as well. So we need to feel the guts being pushed down and pushed out in every direction. When there's a baby in the front, it's blocking that and you're being pushed forward. So it's also compressing the low back tissue. So now you have a front and back that feel really tight all the time. So what you'll see is they're, when they're pregnant, a lot of times the lady's hips will turn out more. So their feet will be more pigeon toed mm -hmm. because they're getting too much pressure front to back. So the only way they can go is out that they have to like turn their legs out and squat wider or lift wider legs because their belly is now in the way. Again, same things apply to anybody that's overweight then. So if we can get them to still feel that up and down motion happening by using their legs properly, like lifting in a way, again, you're going to have to modify. Um, but it's not nearly as much as people think, you know, right. you, you can get away with like using heel wedges when you squat with not having to widen your feet out as much, you know, if you're pregnant, it, right. you know, you can still be fairly close. That's going to give you a little extra wiggle room. Um, or you can just be flat ground and have to go a lot wider with your feet. But when that stuff's happening, all that stuff's being stretched out. Our bodies are amazing. They'll compensate and work around whatever problems we need to. Again, by the feet turning out, everything's hips get wider at that point because there's a lot more elasticity in there due to some of the hormones that are helping that. Um, but pre having the baby, just working on core and obliques and breathing, which feels really hard, but laying on your side and, and working on keeping some of that exhalation strategy. So when we say exhalation, that's going to be internal rotation again. They're moving into way more external rotation when they're pregnant because of the position of their body. So you have to maintain some of that internal strength to help keep the baby up. So now you're not just talking about the guts getting pushed out the bottom. You have to keep the baby up for nine months. Right. If you can't, it gets really hard to move around. Like going up steps gets harder, but that's your ability to push things up still. So keeping that strength or having it beforehand is like most ideal because um, you're not going to lose as much if you start with a lot more. But um, keeping that ability to push into the ground, you know, be able to squat, be able to move those lunges, steps, whatever, it's just going to keep that pressure off the bottom of the pelvic floor all the time. And I think the big misconception, like publicly, about pregnancy and postpartum and pelvic floor stuff is just everybody just needs to do Kegels. Mm. So if you're not familiar with Kegel, it's just kind of like where you're thinking about squeezing and pulling everything up and in in your pelvic floor, like just clench everything. Right. Um, you can have a pelvic floor that's too loose and lengthened. Okay, those are people that can't get the pelvic floor back up very well. And you can have a really tight and high pelvic floor. So somebody that already has a high and tight pelvic floor, if they're squeezing it and pulling it up tighter, it's going to make them feel worse. If somebody has a really lengthened one, that might help a little bit. But if you're still not teaching how to drive that force up, the whole gut, the whole ba the baby, everything, you're just creating a squeeze on an area that's already strained. Okay. Um, I don't have a better way to explain that, I don't think. But other than just like the hammocks push too far down and we can't get it up. So if it's pushed down and you're just squeezing it while it's down, it's just going to kind of compress on itself and create two Makes problems sense. essentially. Right. Um, so some people need to lengthen their pelvic floor and some people need to be able to push their pelvic floor up. So that's where individualizing that 
help to some people mm-hmm. or if you've tried kegels and it didn't work it's like the old idea of like well i've been stretching my hamstrings for five years and it hasn't helped <laughs> yeah. like if the kegels aren't working or if it's making you feel worse you probably need to go the other direction right you know if you don't have somebody advising you just work on lengthening and loosening that space instead of trying to squeeze it sure so d- is there anything that the listeners can do at home to know if they are having a, a tighter pelvic floor or a more lengthened pelvic floor Usually the best place to try to start off, if you're already pregnant, it's going to be a lot harder to like figure it out. But if you figure it out beforehand, we're just measuring the width of their angle of their rib cage. Interesting. So if they have a rib cage that's very close together and narrow, so it's just really small space and like you can barely, some people can barely get their fingers in there. They're going to have a more lengthened pelvic floor typically. Okay. Because our rib cage, our diaphragm tells our pelvic diaphragm what to do, like we kind of discussed initially. So if we have a really wide rib cage, those are people that are going to have a typically higher and tighter pelvic floor already because of the shape of their rib cage and shape of their pelvis. Um, So you can roughly go off of that. There's complications sometimes past that, you know, like if you've had injuries or other things, those things can shift or there can be a twist, you know, instead of just left and right that you can be a little offset but generally speaking if you respect the shape of your rib cage if you help with doing the opposite of that we're going to start to sync up our diaphragm and our chest with our pelvic floor at the bottom okay so if you're really squeezed together we want to loosen that up actually and get your ribs to open up a little bit more and work on getting the pelvis to exhale essentially a little bit better and vice versa for somebody wider. You might put a foam roller on their ribs, which you might be yes. familiar with, <laughs> which helps them close that, right. which is going to help them get that uh, diaphragm to come up, which <clears throat> seems counterintuitive in that sense. But what happens is when we're stuck wide, we're stuck in that inhaled position. Right. Okay. And then everything is just gripped at the bottom because we're not creating that synchronicity of each breath. So um, without getting too nitty gritty, it's just, we just want to restore what's happening here to start to give our pelvic floor a chance. If people go right for the pelvis first and they don't have this, they're just not going to see a lot of improvements with whatever they go after, whether it's Kegels or just purely lengthening. Adding in that breath and getting the rib cage to move will help finish their core working better. So to strengthen the pelvic floor, mm-hmm. it not being the answer not being Kegels, mm-hmm. what would you say are three introductory movements that mm-hmm. everyone should do? Yeah, I think when we're talking about the pelvic floor, it, it's best to not actively think about using it as much. You know, like people are like, oh, squeeze it or hold it. Like it should be reactive, right? So... If we're breathing in, it's stretching. If we're breathing out, it's coming back up. So if we can make sure that we are breathing evenly through core exercises, that's going to be a huge start right off the get-go. So if we're doing a side plank and working on feeling our obliques on one side, but we're holding our breath when we do that, we're not synchronizing our pelvic floor with our core muscles. So by learning to take a five or six second inhale and a five or six second exhale, while we're learning to be connected to our left obliques, that's going to help our left pelvic floor more because it's going to move up and down the whole time you're engaging those muscles versus just being static and held. So I think you can pretty much pick any position core wise and focus on the breath. So stuff that you're already doing, you can get better at. Mm -hmm. Um, if somebody tends to feel a lot of pelvic floor pressure, like they just feel like the weight, especially if you've had a kid or pregnant, they'll feel that difference of like, oh, it feels like my pelvic floor wants to come out. Mm -hmm. Adding a small inversion can be really helpful. It's usually intuitive to be like, oh my God, just flip me upside down and it's going to feel better. But it really does just getting like elbows on the floor, knees on the floor, like in a hands and knees on elbows position your butt is just a little bit higher than your upper body then. So the weight of the pelvic floor is moving back into the stomach and the chest area. So it can really relieve a lot of that down pressure somebody's having. 
So again, just taking those even breaths in that slightly inverted position can help move the pelvic floor back up into the chest cavity a little bit more so the guts aren't constantly pushing down on it. So inversions can be really helpful. Um, and then I think for the opposite spectrum, um, something besides a core exercise would be teaching people how to squat all the way down. Um, usually they're gonna be like hand supported, like on a sink. Um, maybe using wedges or a book under their heel, but learning to lean back and then sit all the way down into a deep squat as long as they're not having pain with that. Mm -hmm. That pressure can help move their pelvic floor down if there's somebody that just feels tight down there all the time. So that would be the other half of that spectrum of like somebody needs to learn to lengthen. A deep squat position is going to be a position where everything's getting pushed down and then you just sit there and breathe. You just take the six in and six out until your legs start to feel a little tired, just like sitting in a deep squat position. You come back up, take a break, um, depending on how well trained somebody is for that or not. Right. Um, and if they're really under trained, get them down most of the way, put like a small block or a bench or something underneath them so they can almost start to rest into it and use like half effort at that point. But learning to lengthen in a deep squat, learning to get the pelvic floor up in a small inversion, um, and then adding the consistent inhales and exhales to any and all core exercises um, would be the way to kind of get the pelvic floor a little bit more synchronized. Low reps is best. High reps is best. Fruit is so it's good. It's terrible for you. You should lift heavy. High reps, Carbs low are weight. needed. Keto Squats are bad for your Squats knees. are great You should squat ass to grass. Toes. It's fine. It fits my macros. It's for idiots. When there are so many mixed messages going around, it's hard to know what you should even do or focus on. But that's exactly where physique development one-on-one -on -one coaching comes in. You might have heard of online coaching or even hired a coach before, but we believe in teaching teaching you the why behind what we do while truly taking your life into consideration. We want to train, educate, and empower you to reach your goals and help you to stop spinning your wheels and just finally feel good. And hey, we're here to help you look good too. You need you. Your health is your wealth. So join Physique Development and let us be the last coach you ever need. Okay. So you brought up one misconception earlier with the Kegels. Mm -hmm. Was there any others that you can think of that is very commonly assumed, but is actually not the best thing um, surrounding pelvic floor. Yeah. I mean, I'm not a pelvic floor therapist, although a lot of people come in and not telling me about their pelvic floor problems until like the second or third session. I'm like, actually, now that you brought that up. <laughs> so I don't hear a lot of the front end stuff like a pelvic floor. Like they'll hear all the things about like what's going on or what somebody's tried or not tried. Um, but I think for people, they get concerned with like visually how it's working initially. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you'll see this even, um, in like competitive bodybuilders and stuff where they'll have like a, a diastasis in their upper abs where their six pack doesn't look even. It's like zigzagged. That's just because they're actually pulled that tissue apart and there's a little bit of space in between there. Mm. Um, so most women postpartum have a, a, some degree of diastasis. And they can be very concerned about that at some times. But that's just part of the normal having a baby. Um, it's going to be pulled and stretched a little bit while the baby's in there. What we're looking for is working the core without the core really getting a huge dome on it. It'll kind of look like an alien's coming out of your stomach. Um, and even just, again, you'll see this in people that are overweight when they try to sit up. You'll see like a doming in a very particular spot and sometimes it can be on the side. That's kind of how hernias start where the, the, start, the tissue is pushing through the skin where it's weakest and it'll dome. Mm. Um, I like to imagine like a sweet potato in a, in a plastic grocery bag where it like starts to stretch and push through. Like <laughs> that's, that's a good analogy. That's yeah. literally like what's happening in their stomach. Yeah. So we want to challenge somebody's core postpartum um, or even before that if they have issues, like if they've had kids in the past, where we're not seeing doming. Okay. We should be able to breathe and work our core without seeing like that outward pressure. Because if, if they have a huge outward pressure dome, they're not getting pressure evenly throughout. They're just pushing too much of it forward, um, which may exacerbate their symptoms, may not. Like you can't say with pain if that's going to make them hurt at that moment. Um, but we just aren't getting a really, again, balanced, like 360 degree breath when they're doing that. So if someone was to lay down for a crunch mm -hmm. and they see that doming mm -hmm. right away. Yeah. How what what do you advise for them to do next to be in a better position to not have that happen? Yeah, I think 
what you want to realize is, is the exercise I'm doing a little too hard, potentially? You know, it may just be that they're not ready to do a crunch, um, which is frustrating. Um, but I still think if they have a very wide rib cage angle, that means that they're probably more pulled apart through that tissue still. So they actually need to get the ribs to move closer together still. That's going to bring the obliques closer together and not create so much stress, uh, stress and stretch on that tissue. Okay. Like we talk a lot about in weightlifting, um, lengthening, working the muscle in a lengthened position and working the muscle in a shortened position. Well, if you take that same concept and apply it to your core, We don't really do it all that well because if the ribs are spread open, they're in a lengthened position. But nobody's teaching you to close your ribs to get the shortened position. And I think that's what we're missing a lot of times is we're not training a shortened rib cage position and we're not sometimes training a widened position depending on the person. Mm -hmm. So we need to get the ribs closer to learn to get the muscle in a more shortened position so it actually has a little bit more uh, mechanical leverage to engage the muscles properly. Because it's just, it's at a poor mechanical disadvantage and we just feel this doming and pressure happening and not feel our core. And then vice versa with somebody really close together. They actually need to reduce that pressure there that's squeezing everything and it's shoving it forward. So they, again, need to, oh, but it's just working the muscle in a lengthened position and in a shortened position. It doesn't have to be a lot more complicated than that. We just treat our core as a six-pack and obliques, not what are the ribs telling the core, you know, what to do. And are the obliques in a lengthened position or a shortened position due to the rib cage position? Right. Since our obliques are attached to them. Yes. I, I, this is for later in the podcast because yeah. we'll talk about our work together mm-hmm. and how much you helped me. But mm-hmm. as we're on the topic and talking about it as much as we are, mm-hmm. I have a very, my rib mm-hmm. cage was very wide set mm-hmm. and yeah. I was having some of the, um, what, what did you call it? Like the area, uh, coning. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I was having that. Yep. And as we worked on my rib cage and going through all the breathing stuff, mm-hmm. that was relieved. Mm-hmm. But the funny thing is now that it's been the time frame since we've worked together, mm-hmm. I can notice it's, it's coming back. Mm-hmm. If I'm, if I'm getting away from my exercises, yeah, yeah, sure. it starts to you know go yeah. back to old ways. Yeah. And it is like my number one signal of, Hey, you got to yeah. get back into, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you got to get back into your routine. Uh, and it's crazy because when I had come to you, I was dealing with so much random pain, mm-hmm. just like pain in my lower back, pain mm-hmm. in my scapula, mm-hmm. just pain mm-hmm. throughout my back for mm-hmm. di- varying reasons that yeah. I thought was just kind of like, I'm just going to have to deal with this. Mm-hmm. I'm getting old. Here it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we went through the, all the breathing uh-huh. stuff yeah. and those things were relieved, uh-huh. which is mind blowing to me. Yeah. It opened up my mind to everything that we're talking about today and so mm-hmm. much more mm-hmm. um, beyond what my knowledge was when I had first come to work with you. Yeah. Um, and I've, you know, all those random pains were alleviated. Mm-hmm. But again, if I get away from the consistency, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. they start to peek their their head yeah. back in a little bit. Mm-hmm. And so it really, it is a matter of being very consistent mm-hmm. with the work, but it, mm-hmm. it this does not only apply to pregnancy, mm-hmm. it applies to literally everybody. Yeah, it's it's literally like encouraging to practice balance, right? Yes. You know, and I think that's a big problem that people run into with working out, lifting weights, um, whether it's, competitive athletes or not is like i believe more and and again maybe this too is like it's a nutrition thing too that we accept more with nutrition but like lifting and working out needs to be cyclical a little bit too you know like you don't go through a fat loss phase for five years straight i I hope not i mean people do but (laughs) (laughs) but that's not going to be advantageous to making progress yeah so people like to go hard in a gym too long sometimes without paying attention to the signals happening and you literally have just like oh like i know some of the signals now that my body's moving too far in one direction you know and that's what the beauty is like learning about your own body then is like i know the signals my body's giving me if i start to move too far and anytime we lift heavy weights we're gonna get a little bit squeezed and compressed and we're not gonna feel our best again, for a good reason. We're building muscle tissue, we're lifting weights, with all the benefits that come with that. But then when you find that line of like, oh, like my body's telling me to pull back a little bit, then you kind of spend a little bit more time restoring optimal movement and health, and then you can go hard again without breaking down. 
because you you have those indicators a little bit. But otherwise, people just want to go hard and don't respect those things. And there's no off season, you know, and you just eventually break down, like getting hurt and having pelvic floor problems and having back pain. Like those are bigger limiters to progress than anything else. Mm -hmm. You know, if we can stay in the gym and stay healthy, we can get stronger for a long time. Right. Um, But yeah, it's uh, so much is driven by how well our core and pelvic floor work together um, that, you know, it's kind of impossible to ignore. Yeah. To, to say the least now from the, you brought up a little bit of the aesthetic and people thinking of it as just a six pack. Mm -hmm. What are the other benefits? I mean, outside of what you've already discussed, Mm -hmm. but what are the other benefits that the core provides outside of the aesthetic Mm -hmm. purposes, I suppose? Yeah. I think, one other piece to think about when we're like training core and working on stuff is like, if you go after your six pack first, you know, aesthetically driven, like, oh, I want a six pack. You can actually make all the other stuff worse. Mm. Our six pack actually inhibits the diaphragm from working. So when you squeeze the six pack, it pulls your chest. So you have a, what's called a pump handle. Essentially it's our sternum. And it's supposed to lift up and down when we breathe. Our six pack attaches to it. So it can pin our pump handle down and squeeze our diaphragm underneath it, which is going to create a what would be like an anterior diaphragm or an anterior pelvic floor problem because you're just really trying to hammer the six pack first. Mm. So I think for most people, it's order of operations is if you can get rib cage and pelvis, your breath moving really well. Then you hammer on your obliques really well. Then you know that you can get the rib cage motion. You can feel your core on the sides a little bit more and then add in six pack work after that. I think that would be like a better order of operations for most people to see the most benefit and balance long-term versus, you know, you'll see some people with like and it's easier to see on people that are really lean. Like you'll see competitive athletes that look like their left ribs stick out a little bit more, mm-hmm. or you'll see their right ribs are a lot closer to the center. And that just means they're twisted. Um, I've even had heard people like getting their ribs removed, um, competitors to try to look better aesthetically. But if they just learned how to use them, they probably wouldn't need to have them taken out in the first place. They, right. It would look aesthetically the way they wanted it to. But again, that's what we were just talking about is they didn't have that balance of like learning like, oh, these ribs are out because I'm not using my intercostals and my obliques. Right. You know, so I got a little off your question there. Um, that's not, it's, but, yeah, you're still on topic. But it's still learning like maybe an order of operations is the best way to do it. It's kind of like, oh, like, you know, walk before you run or crawl before that, you know, like just kind of getting those steps in place for most people would probably save a lot of people, a lot of discomfort and pain along the way. If we kind of follow that order of operations. I have a feeling that we have a lot of listeners right now who are thinking I've never even thought about my breathing. Mm -hmm. I've just breathed my Mm -hmm. entire life. So what would you say to that person Uh who's just wanting to start incorporating that first thing to avoid all the things that you've talked about so far. That's that's my favorite uh, question or topic that comes into me when somebody walks in. They're just, they look at me like, I breathe fine. I've <laughs> been breathing my whole life. I was, the, I was yeah, one of yeah. them. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like, no. Technically, that's not breathing. That's respirating. Yes. We're respirating, which is an automatic thing that's happening. Breathing is conscious. So like having awareness of our breath is it's actually one of the cool parts of our body in the sense that like we can actually do both. We can turn it on autopilot and we can control it. Like we typically can't tell our heart to slow down or speed up on autopilot or like by our control. So we actually have control of our nervous system with our breath. So if we haven't thought about it before, again, that's totally fine because it runs on autopilot for us and we get to live. Like it's the first and last thing we do on earth. So it is important. But having some awareness of our breath kind of comes back into more of the realm of like meditation or, you know, just having conscious breath and awareness um, to be in a more mindful state. So that's kind of my favorite thing about breathing is like it covers everything. 
It covers mindfulness and meditation and brain health. You know, it covers our biomechanics, like how well our ribs and pelvic floor are working together. You know, it shifts some chemicals to slow down our heart and everything else that's happening in our body, uh, more so the blood pressure and all those vasodilators and stuff. But, you know, the heart kind of runs on its own. Um, but we do have some give and take that's happening with having conscious breath. So there's like an innumerable amount of things that can be beneficial about it. So I think first is literally just to notice it. Like, how do you breathe? Because that matters too. Like, are we breathing through our mouth? Are we breathing through our nose? Can we breathe through our nose if we're not? Um, where is our tongue at? So like when we talk about core, we talk a lot about rib cage and pelvic floor, but it starts at our mouth. You know, our tongue in a perfect world is on the roof of our mouth. And when we breathe in, it stays there. If we're breathing back out through our nose, our tongue never leaves the roof of our mouth. That actually opens our airway. So we get a lot of like the forward head posture, talk and stuff like that. Our head is just moving forward in space because we can't breathe. So it's asking us to try to open the airway more. So the more the head moves forward, usually the more compressed their rib cage is. So it's like trying to make space. So again, when we're sleeping, our mouth opens to try to get more air in like sleeping, snoring, sleep apnea, all that jazz. So, well, the other piece of that is, uh, you know, grinding our teeth. That's also the same thing. Our brain is trying to slide our jaw forward like that to try to open the airway more. So we want to respect how we're breathing. So preferably our noses are for breathing, mouths are for eating and talking. So if we can get good at that, we notice the air a little bit better, we should be able to feel like um, we're getting some motion. And I, I actually from an old book I read, I, I kind of like the idea is that what they do for lay people is they have, or just anybody reading this book, like you can test yourself, is they take like one of the flexible tape measures uh, and put it around your rib cage, um, just right around where the xiphoid process is. And when you inhale as much as you can, you take whatever that number is, and then you exhale for as long as you can and close your ribs for as much as it is, and you look at the difference between the number. So it's telling you, can you expand your ribs and can you close your ribs? Mm. If you can only open them and you can't close them very much, the, the difference in the number is going to be very minuscule. So that, I, I don't know the exact ratio, but um, having a couple inches of difference between the inhale and exhale tells us that we're getting some good rib cage motion. So people could feel that with their hands, they can use a tape measure, but there should be noticeable change between inhales and exhales um, to be able to notice whether we're getting uh, some of that happening. So those are just all things you start with noticing. Mouth position, nose, tongue, you know, what you're doing there, feeling your ribs move at all. You can use visual cues too. So if it looks like somebody's chest is always sunken in uh, and caved in, you're one of those people that wants to try to like fix their posture all the time, you know, that's just, you're just really caved in in the chest wall in the front. So we'd want to work on feeling the air move into the chest, you know, when we're doing some relaxed breathing. Um, and you can technically just take your fingers and feel your pelvic floor too. I think that's most helpful for most people. It's like you find the bone that you sit on, just go just inside of that a little bit. And then when you take a breath, do you feel air moving in your pelvic floor? Is there nothing happening down there? Can you feel the up and down motion happening? Um, so I think for most people, just using our own hands, you know, noticing where air is starting, where it ends, um, is really helpful to just start to get that awareness going. Okay. I, to speak on my own experience, when we first started working together, my ribs were like cement blocks. Mm -hmm. They didn't move mm -hmm. really at all. I was mm -hmm. just breathing through my, my stomach for the most mm -hmm. part. I wasn't mm -hmm. using my lungs yeah. well at all. Mm -hmm. And it was such a noticeable difference to be able to experience that. Like it applied through my entire day. Mm -hmm. It was, I mean, it was, as I'm going to say probably a hundred times to this episode, it was crazy and mind boggling. Yeah. The other thing we can think about too is just like from the aspect of stress, like day to day, you know, like if we're, we're inherently a stressed society, but if we are stressed, we are going to be in a more inhaled position, okay? So that's going to literally make us more stressed. It ramps up our heart rate, makes everything kind of go haywire. Uh, if we're in that position for 10 hours a day, yeah. okay, we're never feeling the other half of our breath. 
you know, we're just kind of stuck in this position, which doesn't allow rib cage motion, doesn't allow us to change our nervous system very well, which could make people grumpy all day, you know, or irritable or whatever. So, you know, we can look at ourselves, you know, and be more responsible for ourselves in that aspect. And like, look, like, if I don't want to be wound tight all the time, maybe I should start working on relaxing, taking some exhales, making sure that I'm just not living in that state constantly. Uh, and then sometimes, you know, it does take some assistance and feeling and coaching through some stuff, but we do want to let our ribs move into the position that says we're relaxed. So ribs open means stressed, Ribs closed means we're actually mentally and physically relaxed. So I can see when somebody walks in, like, are they somebody that's going to be more wound tight and stressed? Or are they somebody that can actually, sometimes people have a hard time ramping up, mm. you know? So you'll see some people that are on the lower end of that spectrum that don't get ramped up really easily because they're in that opposite spectrum too. That's interesting. Um, one of the, the common questions that we get from clients is addressing the lower abdomen and mm -hmm. either it being body fat, it being gut, it being things that could be potentially going on with their breathing. Yeah. So how does the lower abdomen pooch that many yep. would call it, yep. how does that, uh, intertwine with, with their breathing? Yeah. More often than not. You know, it's especially postpartum. That's the thing that kind of takes over is a big postpartum problem for most women is they feel like they can't get their lower abs back. Uh, I mean, it happens to a lot of people, though. If you just imagined your guts inside of you or a bucket and the bucket is tipping forward, the water then comes out of the front of the bucket um, if we're doing it that way. And that is literally our guts wanting to push over the front and they're spilling out the front into that pooch. We don't have enough strength and control to bring it back and in and push it back into the back of our body still. So we're typically living in more of an anterior oriented pelvis. Our ribs are still a little bit far forward in space. So irrespective of our width of our rib cage, we can still be forward in space. So they're not the same thing, right? We're just talking about the width of them this way. That's our bucket handle ribs going left and right. We can still be like, again, fitness competitors are, are big ones. Pregnant women have no choice. That They just tend to have a lot of extensor tone and they're pushed forward in space. They're on their toes. That's going to push our guts forward constantly. So a lot of times if we never move the center of gravity backwards and relax the extensor tone on the back and get the pelvis, the posteriorly orient a little bit, we'll never be able to get rid of that lower pooch belly feeling. So the more we bring them back in space and roll that back, release some of the tension in the uh, extensor groups, whether that's glutes, whether that's just QLs, erectors, those kind of muscles, um, they both do the same thing. They're extending the body forward. So sometimes we have to reduce that tension on the backside before somebody has a chance at feeling their low abs. So they'll be like, yeah, I've tried all these core exercises and I don't feel it there. I only feel my upper part. Well, that's the people that can squeeze. They'll literally have a more shortened tissue here and they'll have lengthened tissue here. We can have shortened and lengthened in one muscle group. You know, like you could shorten your distal hamstrings by doing, you know, hamstring curls in like a seated position, but you didn't change the proximal part of your hamstrings unless you create a posterior pelvic tilt too. So I think people underestimate like we can change the length at each end separately. So getting into that more posterior pelvic tilt is going to help bring that. I don't know if that would be considered. I'm assuming that's considered distal, you know, six pack or lower obliques down that end. We would have to roll the pelvis back in space, get rid of the extensor tone, and then they can be able to feel their lower abs kick in and the guts will get pushed backwards. Are you sick and tired of your glutes not growing? turning around in the mirror and seeing a board for a booty. I've been coaching for nearly a decade, helping thousands of women reach their goals. The most common goal, grow my glutes. Women in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and even 60s able to grow their glutes 
with the guidance of my training programs. And for all this time, I've kept my best glute growth secrets only for my one-on-one clients. And that changes today. We just released our 12-week glute growth program in the PD training app. It is a four-day program with exercise and volume adjustments every three weeks. You can easily access the program through our app and track every single workout. Each exercise will have a detailed video teaching you exactly how to perform each and every movement. And guess what? I am no longer gatekeeping. I'm sharing every single one of my best glute growth secrets inside this program. Because you are awesome and I want you to have this program, I'm going to give you $25 off, making it a fraction of what you spent at Starbucks this past month. Use code POD. The link to purchase will be in the description. Now let's get back to the show. So for someone coming to you, yeah, they have the pain. Mm-hmm poor tightness, I should say, through the lower back and glutes. Mm -hmm. How do you first address that to get them into a better Mm -hmm. pelvic position? I mean, the simplest thing anybody can do for themselves is you just take two or three pads or pillows, stack them underneath your stomach, you know, from your pelvis up into like your xiphoid process, which is the top of your ribs right here, um, or the base of your sternum, I guess, and just lay there and breathe in your low back. Like just lay on the pillows and pads, feel the air move into your low back. Because if we smash the front side with pillows and pads, you can't breathe there anymore. It stops us from being able to push our guts forward. So now they feel the air moving in their low back, which should in theory be the same as like me massaging your low back and relaxing it. And then when you flip over to your core exercises, you might actually end up feeling that you can get some contraction in that lower abs now all of a sudden. But it's just, again, by laying on those pads, we moved your center of gravity backwards and we reduced the extensor tone and the glutes aren't contracted. The low back can't be contracted in that position um, because they're flexed a little bit. Um, So you just position yourself in a way that should reduce tone naturally and just take those six in, six out, just kind of get comfortable with the breath again. And then a lot of people can automatically feel like whatever they need to feel just start to kick on after that. So do you recommend that every day? Do you recommend it before every workout? You would do that long enough that if you feel like you can't feel your core right off the get-go, then that's how long you'd want to start. Like you could try a core exercise first as like your indicator whether you're getting it or not. Mm -hmm. If you can do a dead bug or a side plank or whatever you're shooting for and you can feel the right stuff working and it looks visually in a picture or a video that like the lower abs are moving backwards then just keep working on it that way um if you're not getting the results you want it might be more to do with like hamstring strength for controlling the pelvis but um if you can't normally feel that area and then you lay on the pads and pillows and now you can feel it all of a sudden that's how we would kind of know if like, oh, okay, they're getting it now. Now it's just weak and they can feel it. So we just have to build on some strength there to get them to hold that. Because okay. laying down and doing a core exercise are different than standing up and fighting gravity. Certainly. So yeah. we just have to make that transition for people once they can feel the right stuff working. Okay. Um, the, how, like if you're implementing this and I'm sure it's different with each client that you'd be working with, Mm -hmm. but what's the duration that they're having to consistently, uh, potentially do that Mm -hmm. as well as what is the first indicator outside of the tension? Is there something visual that they would see that's like, okay, this is working. Mm. Um, I think what you'll see, especially if you, you know, like if you're working with you guys, you have progress pictures. So like, it's nice to have pictures. I think most people like just if you want to know if what you're doing is working, like one, take some progress pictures. You know, if you can see it visually in a picture, uh, if you can feel the muscles working and engaging, if your low back or hip discomfort is getting better. Um, my favorite tests are more like, I guess they're more, you know, subjective in the sense that hopefully there's not as much, there's still error involved, but mm-hmm. um, no matter what, is just take your leg and pull your leg up towards your chest. If your hips don't get tight and you don't feel back tension when you bring your leg all the way up to your chest, you're getting better pelvic position, which is going to help your lower abs work. So like if you're laying on your back on the floor, just grab a hold of a leg and bring it all the way into your chest. Shouldn't feel any tightness on the front side. Shouldn't feel back pain or SI joint pain or any of those things. And usually if you do the breathing and do your core exercises, you should be able to feel if you did that first that it got better afterwards. It, we're just getting a better position of the pelvis, which reduces hip tension. Okay. 
I feel like that's super applicable for everyone listening just to be able to kind of walk through this. Cause I like to me, as we're talking through these things, mm -hmm. I just imagine each person being like, Oh, I, I don't do that. Mm -hmm. And then they start to think about their breathing. And as we've progressed mm -hmm. through the episode, mm -hmm. like now they're laying on the floor, mm -hmm. pulling their leg to their chest, seeing mm -hmm. if they've got tightness through their hip, mm -hmm. which is just really cool. I, I like having episodes in this, in this fashion. Yeah. I, I just think like there's so much that people can do from themselves if they get like a rough idea. I, I read this quote the other day because I feel like I get hammered for it all the time is that like people our age, you know, I'm lumping you in, even though you're not quite my age, um, <laughs> get crapped on for not knowing how to like change a sink out or you know like do home remedy stuff all the time but i'm like but you don't know how to do basic maintenance on your body so <laughs> what's the difference like you know like there's this idea that like we know less about life because we can't change the sink yeah. but like i know how to take care of my body and the people around me know how to take care of their body so like which one's more valuable here you know right. like <laughs> So like, those are like basic tests. Like if you're trying to check on your body, if you can't lay on the floor and bring your thigh up to your chest without getting a lot of discomfort on the front or your back pain, then your hips aren't in a very good place. Mm -hmm. So we can use these things to like have basic check-ins with ourselves and then know if like, they call it like a key performance indicator or something, but like, are the things I'm doing helping my hip mobility and my pain and my discomfort? And typically, if you do some breathing and do that before and after, people see huge changes in how well their thigh can come up to their chest without discomfort. Do you feel like for the core work that we've talked about, mm -hmm. do you integrate that with resistance training sessions? Do you integrate that with cardio or is this by itself? <laughs> um, again, my background's in, you know, teaching people how to lift weights. Yeah. So, you know, the adage too is that if you just squat and deadlift, you have a strong enough core, right? Like yes. everybody's I've heard, heard that, that forever. Everybody's heard that, right? <laughs> well, I've recently come to the, the decision that if everything is perfectly lined up, you know, if you have a really good working diaphragm and pelvic floor and you're not too far forward in space, doing a squat or a goblet squat or front squats with a perfectly aligned pelvis, you will feel a lot of core working. Yes. It's a lot different than being pushed forward in space and feeling a lot of extensor tone and not even feeling your legs working sometimes. Like I just did a bunch of squats, but like my legs aren't that beat up. Well, probably because you use 50% back, 50% legs, <laughs> you know, like so – Getting this all organized can allow people to lift weights and see the benefit of their core having most of the effect with a squat or with a deadlift or with rows or push-ups or you name it. And you can get some good core work going in that way and not have to have a lot of dedicated core time other than just making sure that your, your breathing stays balanced. Um, because any amount of heavy lifting is going to squeeze us and we're not going to get as much air in eventually. You know, if you're talking 50%, 60% load, 70% load, you should be able to take a normal breath, you know, air in for six, air out for six, something like that. Mm -hmm. If you're at 90%, like you're not going to be able to get six in, six out and breathe through the reps necessarily. Right. We're taking away some of that expansion and motion in the rib cage to add strength and muscle tissue. But if at the end of our session, we just make sure we restore our normal rib cage motion and, and our breathing, then it won't feel like we're stiff and tight the next day nearly as much as it would if we just like throw in the towel and like, all right, I'm done for the day. I just finished all my deadlifts and I'm not going to do anything else. So like that is increasing blood flow. It's changing our nervous system to a healing position uh, and getting that regeneration started for the next day. Um, we don't have to be just tight or just loose. We can balance that out a little bit. Yeah. One way I implement it with my clients is that if they are training at night, mm -hmm. I have them do it after their training mm -hmm. sessions. Yeah. And it is a 
game changing difference mm-hmm. for their sleep and then their ability to digest the food when mm-hmm. they get home. Absolutely. It makes a massive difference. Yeah. That's um, a great way to do it. And then the the clients I have in the morning, it they kind of split it, mm-hmm. but I encourage them to do it first just so they kind of are more centered going mm-hmm. into the session yeah. and kind of have their wits with them since they just woke up 30 minutes ago or whatever yep. the case yep. was. Um, so if you are in that camp and listening, mm-hmm. those could be applicable applicable ways that you apply it. Yeah. The only thing I found, again, I coached a lot of people for a lot of years at the the gym and stuff, the, the 5 a.m. people, the 6 a.m. people, like if you let them breathe too long, they just like fall back asleep on you, you know, like, so, so I like to like mix in like some stem stuff sometimes, like whether it's like a couple med ball throws or something that like gets them moving a little bit mm-hmm. and then do a breath and then some more stem stuff. Like you kind of have to get their nervous system turned on a little bit too, but you can intermix it that way. Yeah. You don't have to be like just falling asleep doing the breathing. Right. Like it's going to be beneficial even when you're more awake and like in the middle of the day or whatever, but that's a great way to implement it, especially for the people at night like to be able to add that time to decompress what's the end of their day or whatever like again people could find a huge value in just doing that before they go to bed anyways oh yeah you know on a nightly basis if they want to get more and more benefit from that yeah the uh and doing it post training it's 15 minutes probably Mm -hmm. it's not a a ton of time and it's it's so beneficial just calming down the, Mm -hmm. the nervous system yeah and the better you get at doing it like the shorter that time can be yeah I think everything's dose dependent though, right? You know, like if you had 12 coffees in the morning, like you're not going to feel so great about it, you know? (laughs) So if you had a really shitty day, like you might need 20 minutes to wind down at the very end. Mm -hmm. Uh, If you had a great day, you had a great lifting session, you feel good, maybe you can get that relief in five minutes. Mm -hmm. So it's just, again, it's just about understanding your body, understanding the dosage a little bit and kind of giving yourself what you need to, to feel good. I was curious on this, and this may have been better asked earlier, but what are the most common mistakes that people make when they are just training core? So maybe it could be that they're not controlling their breathing, as Mm -hmm. we've kind of talked Mm -hmm. about so far, Mm -hmm. but what would be the most common mistakes that people are, are making when training their core directly? I think that's, I mean, I think we mostly touched on what really gets me the most is like, well, there's even Pilates or um you know other aspects of like motion that people try to think of as core exercises you know is that flexing your spine and exhaling your ribs together are not the same thing so like there's two different camps too that like in fitness i feel like there's one group that like you need to smash your back into the floor like on your when you're laying on your back to be able to feel your core work a little bit or, you know, in Pilates, like the, they call it imprinting, I think, where they try to flatten the low back into the ground all the time. But if you're just turning into a turtle, like you're just curling over to do that, how much carryover are you going to have to all the other exercises that you want? Like most people are doing core for help with something else, like uh, performance wise, usually. Uh, if you just want to look f- good for aesthetics, it's a little bit of a different thing, but, and you don't have any pain, then that's cool. Do what you want to do. But um, if we want to squat more, but our core gives out, then people are wanting to work their core to help their squat out. Or, you know, in sports, like maybe an offensive lineman's core isn't strong enough and people keep turning them and twisting them and different. You, you pick whatever sport and thing you want and apply it, right? Well, if you can't keep yourself upright and you need to be able to be upright to do the exercise in the sport or whatever else, it doesn't make sense to like curl up in a ball to do that um, because you're shortening your six pack, but you're widening your ribs out. Um, so depending on what somebody needs, we need to learn to be able to keep our spine long and not flex our spine to engage our core. So like, again, getting a good exhale, doing like a leg lower dead bug type thing, uh, we should be able to feel our core working to support us in a lengthened long position. But again, then you can take, you know, eccentric, concentric, like lengthened, shortened positions, and maybe we need to work our obliques in a more shortened position more often. So we actually need to get into like that more of a side bend position to feel those close and feel these ones open and expand and you'll feel the ribs and intercostals work like that too and you can integrate that stuff into like lat pull downs and other things to actually get some obliques and lats working together to do that so i think for most people it's just 
there's so much complexity to how our ribs and our spine and our pelvis move that most people are probably missing three quarter of the benefits by not hitting all those different pieces when we do that. And not necessarily by their fault, but like I think overall core is kind of lumped together to like crunches and bird dogs and, yeah. you know, some kind of oblique exercise. <laughs> I, I would say just being able to move, like to encourage people to move in all different directions, mm -hmm. not just yep. thinking, okay, I'm going to crunch and I'm going to do different variations of the crunch mm -hmm. so that I can have a stronger overall core. Yeah. Um, being able to move in different directions and have stability and mm -hmm. comfort getting to different ranges and so on yeah. is probably the most beneficial thing that you could do. And I think just changing the same exercise in different positions, you know, whether it's on all fours, you're doing something, whether you're doing it in a side position, like an like a oblique sit or a side plank, uh, on your back, doing the same things, doing it standing up, mm -hmm. like just changing your relationship to gravity can make the exercise significantly harder, or easier too. So both of those things, I think like hitting every angle, like imagining moving in different planes, um, and then being able to, you know, change our relationship to gravity, like on your back, on all fours and so forth would be a great way to make sure you're mixing that up and hitting the different things. Absolutely. So I thought we could finish up with talking a little bit about myself because mm -hmm. I think that I would relate to a lot of our listeners in the sense that I am sitting at a desk mm -hmm. a large portion yeah. of my day. Mm -hmm. um, I'm resistance training four days a week under heavier loads. Mm -hmm. Um and I was dealing with the little bit of back mm -hmm. pain, a little mm -hmm. bit of upper back pain, yeah. um, pain through my hips. Mm -hmm. And when I had come to you, it was a, you had a lot of certainty that mm -hmm. you're going to be able to mm -hmm. fix the things. And yeah, I was yeah. looking at you like, dude, I feel like I've been dealing with this forever. Yeah. And uh, you, you said it, it was maybe three or four months. Yeah. And uh, I thought it was a little crazy that we we're going to handle it that quickly. Yeah. Uh, to my surprise, yeah. it was that and more being yeah, yeah. able to get figured out. Uh, so in terms of, someone who's probably falling in the same camp as myself, mm -hmm. what would be the, the first steps for them to maybe dig into or better understand outside of what we've already shared today um, to move in the right direction with their breathing, their, their rib cage mm -hmm. movement, mm -hmm. those different things. Yeah. I think we've covered a lot of great stuff okay. to this point that yeah. can be really helpful. I think the other thing that social media or the internet or whatever is kind of, cause the problem I think is by making people overly aware of their posture and their sitting and how they do things um, when they're working at a desk all day. Um, a couple of the big ones are how you sit, you know, like you're supposed to sit perfectly with your shoulders back and chin tucked in. And like, that's probably going to make most people feel worse uh, to be honest. So like when we're sitting in a chair you know, we need to have our butt bones underneath us. If we can have our feet on the floor, even better. Um, and then outside of that, we just want to sit relaxed. We do not want to be squeezing our shoulder blades together while we're trying to sit tall. That's literally teaching your rib cage and your shoulder blade how to not work together. <laughs> um, so I think for most people, it's undoing some of those things too. Like, I feel like that's half my session when people come in, like that work at a desk all day, especially if they're into health. They have some awareness of how they should be sitting. And that might be what's giving them half their problems. Um, so, the you know, the pulling the shoulders back while you're typing, terrible idea. Don't be doing that. Um, and then the chuck, tucking the chin in, too, is another one. You know, like, get tall. That actually closes your airway. That's kind of like what we talked about. Our, our body pushes our head forward to try to make room for air. So when we tuck our chin too much, it actually closes the airway down. Um, and that's another one like with lifting that you want to be real careful about is like, it's okay to like have a straight neck and head, but we don't want to tuck hard because that actually makes it harder to breathe, which then is going to limit our rib cage motion and pelvic floor motion. So I think for most people sitting desk, desk jockeys, like try to find comfortable support of your spine and your back, um, head, just try to keep it on roughly straight. If you're always looking left at the computer, you know, try to switch that up. Like we don't want to be stuck in any one position, which includes shoulder blades pinch back or whatever. So when you get to the point where you're feeling uncomfortable, it probably is time to take a walk, get lunch, move around a little bit. And you can do some of the same stuff that we talked about earlier, sitting down in your chair at desk. Like put your hand on your chest, feel your ribs moving, put your hands on your ribs, feel them moving left and right. 
you know, if you use a band or something, you can put it around your waist and just feel all the air expanding in every direction. Um, having a little bit of conscious breath around lunch helps with digestion. You know, it kind of pulls you out of that stress mode. But even just restoring normal breathing and motion through those areas stops them from feeling so stiff. Like so many people come in with neck pain and mid back pain because they're holding tension there on purpose. Like mm -hmm. they think that they're sitting their posture properly. So they think they're doing something right, but they actually create the problem of their back pain by trying to squeeze and hold that stuff. So I think day to day, like out, like, cause again, I think we covered a lot of like how to do it in the gym For and sure. how to move and do things that way. I think the biggest one is just, not screwing yourself over when you're sitting down um, by holding tension sitting. Like try to get relaxed and, and let your body, again, if we're holding tension, we're squeezing muscles. Squeezing muscles squeezes the ribs, which stops them from moving. Like we need to allow rib cage motion when we're, we're sitting and working and typing. Uh, and we shouldn't really have to think about our posture 24 seven. Yeah. That'd be very nice. Maybe in a perfect world, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. But again, that just again, when you need to move, move a little bit. Like right. we're not made to sit still all day. So we are gonna have to intermix some motion in to to alleviate that. Yeah. And and <clears throat> I, I I feel like office chairs are something that people just buy because it's it's just a chair. Mm -hmm. But then they're spending nine to ten hours in mm -hmm. that stinking chair. Yeah. And they're like, my back is killing me. I've had yeah. clients send me pictures. I'm like, that looks like a paper bag that you're sitting on. <laughs> what, are we, yeah. what are we doing? Yeah. Right. <laughs> Let's get you a real chair. You're there all day. Yeah. And then you get some people that switch over from the crappy chair to the yoga ball. You know, <laughs> <laughs> like I just making a 360 here. Here we go. You know, like, uh, yeah. but yeah, we just want to, you know, find comfort and support for people, you know, pillows, pads, like you can dress it up even if your chair is uncomfortable right? and try to add some structure to your body so that it feels more relaxed and you're not holding yourself up all day in those positions. James, it was fantastic having you on. We're going to have to have you back on. Yeah, I have a feeling great. that after these guys listen to it, it's going to be like, okay, we got to have you back on. So next Love time you're back in town, we'll get back into some other topics. And maybe if you guys have specific topics that you'd like to hear, let us know. Can you let everybody know where they can find you? I am currently hiding myself a little bit better than oh, normal. I did get off Instagram with having the new oh, baby recently. Okay. Um, I just thought that was a great time to, to have an extended break. That's fair. Um, so uh, basically my website at this point, um, so James Fryer, NMT, as in neuromuscular therapist, uh, com. So that's my website now. And you can email me and reach out. And if you have any questions, feel free to hit me up that way. Awesome. Thank you guys for listening. And we'll see you in the next episode.